Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dizzy to Me. My name is Dr. Danielle Tolman. I'm a vestibular physical therapist and as always joined by my co-host, Dr. Abby Ross, who is also a vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist. And today we are joined by our listener favorite, uh, Jeff Walter, who is here to talk to us today about atypical BPV, which we're really excited to talk about. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Looking forward to it. Good morning. Thank you for joining us again. If you could just give our audience a little bit of a background in case they haven't listened to your previous episodes, tell us how you got into vestibular, where you're at now, what you're doing. Okay. So I, um, I, so I practice vestibular rehab at Geisinger Medical Center in central Pennsylvania um, within our ENT department, otolaryngology department. I work with several audiologists and another physical therapist. I do some vestibular testing also and have an interest in research. And I do teaching primarily through MedBridge. Um, and I just really, really love vestibular. Um, I like the mechanics of it. I think the population tends to be underserved and misunderstood and kind of reeled me in. As a lot of people, I think on the same, you know, I can speak for that too. You reeled me into vestibular therapy and I haven't looked back since. So it's been, it's been amazing. I wanted to mention one thing before we got started. I was uh, seeing a patient that just had routine posterior canal BPV this week. And I, I use Danielle's video on vestibular today a lot, which shows home instruction for patients that are appropriate for home treatment of their BPPV. And when I went to share the video link with the patient, I noticed that that video link has 1.2 million hits. So that's really amazing. I wanted to compliment you guys on all your work and just think of what kind of outreach that is. And if the video also had a thousand comments and I just paged down a little bit, read the comments and it was so um, almost like touching to read how much it had helped patients. So I just wanted to compliment you on your efforts. Um, to, to help patients. And that's, that's really awesome. That's been our main goal. So uh, something like that, we just did at the beginning of the pandemic, um, just to kind of educate my own patients and have it turn into what it has been, has been really neat. It's been cool to see how many people reach out and how common people are constantly looking for help. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's an excellent video, by the way, showing home treatment of just routine posterior canal BPV. So I would encourage clinicians to use that because it's very patient friendly. Thank you. Absolutely. And also just a little plug here, Danny and I do have more videos coming. So we have it on schedule to be recording. We'll definitely post those videos for you to all look at, share with your patients, share with other clinicians. But yeah, congrats, Danny, on over 1 million views. That's so great. Um, let's get into today's topic now. Today's topic is atypical BPPV benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So first, let's just talk about what is a typical BPPV. Sure. And maybe before we do that, just one comment. If I, it's important for this to follow on with this podcast that you have a, a, a decent understanding of vestibular anatomy and physiology and routine BPPV. And it's also, I think, important when you delve into these variants of BPV that we're going to talk about, video goggles are essential um, with some of the things we're going to talk about today. And I think you guys have podcasts on goggles or information on how to obtain goggles and what are the pros and cons of each. But to really feel comfortable getting into this area, you really, as a therapist or a clinician, you really need video goggles to, to do this well. I think Michael Hilmaki is kind of famously quoted as saying, um, doing a vestibular assessment without video goggles is like trying to figure out what's wrong with a weak patient without a reflex hammer. So that kind of that quote always stuck with me. And I think that that's true. It's sort of like a carpenter without a hammer. So you, you really need video goggles to understand as well. But I guess our definition today for a typical BPPV would be discussing emerging, um, emerging forms of BPPV that we're starting to recognize um, and maybe just getting into less common mechanisms for how debris, which debris will define as otoconia with underlying utricular membrane, because it's probably not just calcium carbonate crystals. We typically tell patients that to simplify it, but there's some underlying otolithic membrane likely with the debris. How can debris that's loose within the vestibular organ uh, distort function? 
And then maybe also talk about how, um, when we talk about atypical BPV, maybe BPV is not, that's not responding to your common treatments. So BPV that's a bit resistant to your typical treatment methods. So that's kind of what's under our umbrella of discussing atypical BPV today. So this is like uh, for the patients that uh, people treat, you know, positional vertigo, they go to do a Dix Hall Pike and they don't get the results that they expect to see, or maybe they don't get any results at all, or maybe things look very different than what they would expect in a roll test. Um, and then kind of looking at the nystagmus and scratching their head and going, what do I do now? This isn't textbook, this isn't straightforward. So it sounds like this will be something that, this is for the occasional patient that you might have that doesn't present like a textbook case of uh, positional uh, vertigo that you can treat with an Epley or a roll or a Gufoni, anything like, along those lines. So that these are not your unicorns. These are not your one and dones that come into your office that we all love so much. But let's start in then by, okay, we have a patient, we think it's BPPV, we've done an Epley maneuver repeatedly, it's not working. What other considerations do we need to start thinking about? Yeah, so there's really a lot to cover here. I think the first thing is revisit the diagnosis is important. Um, just some tips that I would offer um, that I've learned to be, that I think are helpful just through experience is, are the eye movements you're seeing with your positioning test, are the eye movements in the plane of the semicircular canal? Remember if we have canal driven nystagmus, so if there's debris in the posterior canal, one thing that's helpful is when you do, for example, your right Dix Hall Pike, we expect up beating right torsional nystagmus but the vertical component should be enhanced when you gaze towards the ceiling because your eye moves in the plane of the semicircular canal. So if you think about it, when you're back in a right Dix Hall Pike, gazing left, your globe would move more vertically when you gaze right. If the eye's moving in the plane of the canal, it's gonna be more torsional. So seeing that there's a, a stronger torsional component when you gaze towards the ground and a stronger vertical component when you gaze towards the ceiling is something I found more and more helpful over time. So make sure it has those, those two components. The other thing when you're revisiting the diagnosis is look for reversal nystagmus. Reversal nystagmus is, is when we have patients arise after a positive Dix Hall Pike. Um, they should develop downbeat nystagmus with the torsion in the opposite direction. So if they have right-sided involvement, you should see downbeat left torsion. Did a study that was published in the journal, uh, the journal of uh, the American Academy of Audiology last year that just went over how often we see reversal and we see it in 75% of trials in patients with BPV. So it should be present in most cases. So you wanna look for that reversal nystagmus um, to feel more comfortable that your patient truly has cantalosiasis. Um, I think it's a good point to mention too, Ewald's laws um, and how they apply to everything. You know, one of the things that you had taught me when I was on clinical is that you, if you can figure out, um, you know, where those crystals are, for the most part, you can start to picture how to get those crystals out of the canal. And I think Ewald's laws uh, really, really help with that. So like you had just mentioned, the first law is the direction of nystagmus is directly correlated to the canal that's being stimulated, right? Mm -hmm. So this could be, you put somebody back into a Dix Hall Pike, and if you get pure horizontal nystagmus, you're not looking at the posterior canal, you're looking at the horizontal canal. So making sure that you really, uh, uh, you know, delve out what's going on in the, in the testing and which canal is being stimulated will be very important to what guides treatment. Right. And then also remember the nystagmus with cantalothiasis should crescendo and decrescendo, meaning the velocity should increase and then taper off. So if you're putting a patient back and the nystagmus is just sort of muddling along and it takes like 45 seconds to a minute to very slowly fade, that's a little atypical for cantalothiasis. I would keep that in mind too. And then we get into um, if treatments are not working, I think it's important to try to establish is the issue you're getting the debris out of the canal and it's sneaking back in when you do a retest or are you just never getting the debris out of the canal? So I, I found a common misconception and something to think about here is if you do a, a successful maneuver that relocates the debris back to the utricle, what type of nystagmus would we see if you're putting the debris back into the posterior canal when you do a repeat Dix Hall Pike? 
So a lot of people would reflexively say, well, if it's on the right side, you'd see upbeat right torsion, but you wouldn't. You would see reversal nystagmus if the debris re-enters the canal. So just keep that in mind. If you do a retest after doing your canal three positioning maneuver or modified Epley's maneuver, and you put a patient back and had right-sided involvement, but when you put them back, you're seeing downbeat left torsion for several seconds, likely the debris is migrating from the utricle right back into the posterior canal. So look for that reversal nystagmus. And I would say if you see that, repeat a maneuver and just consider not retesting that particular patient because you just may have a patient who it's pretty easy to put the debris back into the canal. So I see that sometimes. I think another thing that's emerging to me as a as a cause of failed treatments is patients that likely have anatomical variability where their semicircular canals winged out too far laterally. And if you look at modeling, um, if your canal is, what we're talking about is normally your, your posterior canal is roughly about a 45 degree angle off a sagittal plane, but we're talking about if it's a little bit more than that. If you look with modeling, what would happen in modified Epley's position number two, it's kind of compelling that the debris can migrate back to the cupula in position two and in individuals that have a canal that's winged out too far. So a change I've made, so if you're listening to the podcast and think, well, what can I do differently tomorrow? I just routinely now, when I do modified Epley's maneuvers, position two, I over-rotate more. So instead of being in 45 degrees of rotation in position two, I'm pretty routinely putting patients in 60 degrees of rotation. If their neck can handle it or I get it from their torso. So, you know, I go back in our standard position for Epley position number one, and then I over-rotate position number two just to make sure that helps if you look at modeling that would help ensure the debris is not going to slide back towards the cupula in individuals that may have canals that are winged out too far um so that's a that's a change i've made and i've noticed that i more commonly get symptoms with nystagmus in that position and now a little less commonly in position three but i think i'm helping ensure that that debris is not migrating back to the cupula um, other things to think about is a, a common change i'll make in a treatment if it's ineffective for posterior canal canalithiasis is extending the patient's head back further. And that's where a tilt table can come in handy, especially if your patient has cervical spine limitations. So that's one of the first changes I'll make if I notice the first maneuver or two is not effective, is getting the head back further for that patient. I found that to be helpful. Other things you consider is using vibration as you do the maneuver, because there is a thought in stubborn cases that the canal lumen may be too narrow in a segment of the canal and you just can't get the debris to bypass that area so the debris moves to a certain point and then comes up against the tight portion of the canal that's more narrow and you can't get the debris past that so in those select stubborn cases you could consider using uh, mastoid vibration also as a thought mm -hmm. do you change the length of time you might keep a patient in each position as well yeah, because there's some evidence that depending on particle size, the amount of time it takes for the for the debris to descend through the endolymph and settle varies. So if you have a stubborn case, I would just take more time, like just pause at each position longer just to make sure every bit of debris is settled. Remember, there can still be debris moving, but eyeballs not jerking. You know, if you have a fair amount of the mass fall at first and it creates enough pressure to induce a nystagmus, you may have some debris that's trailing behind that just isn't significant enough to make the eye move. But you want to make sure you have all that debris settled before you move into the next position. So I would certainly, like if you have a stubborn case, give it more, give each position more time if the initial maneuvers weren't effective. So I think that's a good idea. Another option outside of a tilt table, not everyone has access to a tilt table, but one of the things I found helpful was use of a large wedge so that you could get the patient into a dependent position if they had cervical restrictions. And then also, you know, we don't necessarily always give precautions following BPPB maneuvers, but in some of these cases, would we consider precautions if we're finding that our maneuvers are not successful? Absolutely. You know, it's difficult in a large series of patients to show that post-treatment restrictions add anything. But I think there's individual cases where you have somebody that's just really prone to it, where it's advisable to keep them off their affected side. I think most of us that do this with select cases will emphasize that to a patient. Like if you had a lot of trouble getting it out of the canal in the first place, or it's been multiple treatments with the patient, I would definitely have them more.
strictly follow post-treatment precautions, which can be if if they can just stay on their uninvolved side, they don't need to be elevated. Um, if they're concerned that they won't be compliant with that, then just elevating the head end of the, of the bed about 20, 30 degrees, sleep in a recliner for a night or two nights. I, I do that on, on cases where it is stubborn and I do think it's helpful. Yeah, Ditto, I get questions a lot from clinicians asking about post-maneuver precautions just because I know our clinical practice guidelines are suggesting that we don't need to follow them. Um, yeah, and yeah. The wording on that, Danielle, is the routine use of the post. But that doesn't mean that you can't have selective cases where you decide as a clinician to do that. But I think the emphasis there is routinely having patients do that is not really supported in the literature. But I think okay. use is very... I think it's also important to mention here, you have the patients that say, okay, I'm going to sleep in a in an inclined position forever so that I don't bring on the BPPV again. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a, a finite amount of time, a couple of nights maybe, where they're a little bit more elevated, and then you get back into your normal positioning, normal function following that. I agree. And now there are, a couple, I call them BPPV diamond members that are frequent, frequent, frequent offenders, and they are very troubled by it, and it's happened in either ear cyclically, where really the only thing that's been shown in the literature to help prevent BPV is somehow elevating the head end of the bed. So again, I wouldn't routinely tell patients to do that the rest of their life, but if you have somebody who's really struggling with highly frequent BPPV, they may want to put blocks under the head end of their bed, under their feet, so their bed's just tipped up a little bit or learn how somehow to sleep with their head up just a little higher because that's probably the only thing we're aware of that helps to prevent recurrences in these stubborn cases. But to do that routinely obviously is not, not needed usually. So for these stubborn cases of posterior canal BPV, just to summarize a little bit, um, we can extend the head a little bit more. We can hold positions a little bit longer. Um, uh, a little over rotating into position two of the epley might be helpful. You can add mastoid vibration to potentially help that as well. Um, following post mover precautions is obviously something that's going to be on a uh, patient to patient basis. But what if we aren't looking at the, the posterior canal? What other types of atypical BPV can we see in additional canals, um, you know, including that elusive potential anterior canal BPV? Hmm. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, there's no consensus criteria on what the diagnostic criteria for anterior canal BPV really don't exactly exist. But I guess we would suppose um, if a patient did have it, which, by the way, it's, it's very difficult to see how debris would get entrapped in an anterior canal. But I think it is important as a therapist that you know what you would see if it theoretically was. So you would expect downbeat nystagmus with the torsional component to the involved ear with supine positioning, and it should theoretically be worse with dropping your head, your patient's head back further than what's typical with a Dix Hall Pike. Um, and you would expect their nystagmus to potentially be a little bit stronger when you do your contralateral Dix Hall Pike. So remember that the left anterior canal is in a parallel plane with the right posterior canal. So theoretically, left anterior canal BPV should be a little stronger in a, we call it a deep head hang, but it's just dropping your patient's head back further with their head oriented a bit towards the uninvolved side, not the involved side. So those are some things to think about. The nystagmus should last seconds and theoretically reverse when you sit back up. So those would be what I would suggest the diagnostic criteria should be. Um, the the provocative test for it is a deep head hang. Some do it with a little bit of rotation, like I said, to each side. How deep? Really as much as you can get. Um, you really want the patient's head back. If you look at modeling to get that anterior portion of the anterior canal dependent, you'd really want to go back about 70 degrees if you can do that safely with your patient. Um, so it's called a deep head hanging maneuver. Um, there's two, there was a nice paper that recently looked at, well, with modeling, what maneuvers would we think would help with anterior canal BPV? And the ones from modeling perspective that made the most sense was the Yakovino maneuver, which is basically a deep head hang. You hold for about a minute, then bring the patient's chin up to their chest, hold a minute, and then have them sit up. Um, you know, although this may be anterior canal BPV may be very rare, and perhaps there's diagnostic uh, mimickers that we're going to talk about in a minute, 
I think it's important that you at least, if you think it looks like it might be that, try the treatments and document, you know, further evidence it's not anterior canal BPV is if these maneuvers don't work. So I do think it's important to at least trial the maneuvers if the eye movement pattern somewhat fits because there's no harm in trying that. And it's good to document that you did make an effort to treat them like they did have anterior canal BPV. Another maneuver that's been reported is, and I, this one's pretty easy for maybe a therapist to remember, is it's called the short cantilever three positioning maneuver. And it's basically just doing a modified Epley and skipping position three. So modeling shows that that may help evacuate debris from the anterior canal. So those are the two maneuvers that have been suggested. And again, the short, the short cantilever three positioning maneuver is just basically skipping position three of your uh, modified Epley's maneuver. The disadvantage to that maneuver is you need to know what side's involved. Mm -hmm. The advantage with Yakovino's maneuver is it the treatment's the same for either side. It's a deep head hang, bring the chin to the chest and sit up. So it's not as reliant on the therapist identifying side of involvement. Mm -hmm. Question on that modified Epley then. So you're just sitting the patient up from position two? Correct. Okay. So it's just basically position one and position two of your modified Epley's maneuver. Do you think think oh, go ahead, Abby. I was going to say, do you think you've ever seen a true anterior involvement? Yes, not many though. Um, and so, a fair number of those are ones that were created in the clinic. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think the the mechanism of the of what causes anterior canal BPV, I don't think it happens naturally, like somebody coming in with a posterior canal issue. I think that um, I've only seen two cases of this, uh, potentially two cases, and they were with people who had posterior canal BPV. We did maneuvers to reposition, and then they went directly afterwards. One went to um, her gym where she did inverted push-ups over a stability ball with her trainer. And the other flipped her hair upside down to blow dry her hair. So I think that it was more of a canal conversion. And I know, Jeff, you've mentioned before that using a tilt table to do um, maneuvers can sometimes dip otoconia into the anterior canal. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the most common time I see anterior canal involvement. And for the therapists that, have, that are experienced with vestibular rehab, I think almost all of us, and if you treat patients regularly, this happens semi-regular basis is you, is you have patients that get real intense falling responses when you sit them up after doing a maneuver and so for watching this for years in this phenomena and I, i'm pretty good at getting a patient's head stable when they get up because i might i majored in wrestling in college and i minored in physical therapy so i know how to hold humans in positions they don't want to be in um so when you get into Epley position number three, I hope the ear shows up okay here. And for those of you listening, this may be painful because you can't see. But when you're in Epley position number three, all right, debris can migrate from the posterior canal transiently into the anterior canal. And when you sit those patients up, the debris plunges right out of the canal. And that would be an excitatory stimuli from the anterior canal. And that can be a really potent novel stimuli for your patient. And so they get this really strong falling response. And the reason I believe in this so strong is I've watched the eye movements really closely when these patients have this strong falling response. And it's a downbeat nystagmus and the torsions to the ear you're treating. So we know it's not a reversal from the posterior canal because the torsion would be in the opposite direction if that were the case. So if you're treating a right side, when the strong falling response happens, when we sit patients up, if you're treating a right side, we see a rush of downbeat right torsion. Well, that can only come from two structures, excitation of the right anterior canal, the side you're treating, or inhibition from the opposite posterior canal. So I doubt the debris crossed over the patient's skull into the other ear, I think the better explanation for that is the debris was transiently in the anterior canal. So I'd be aware of that. It, it, the tilt table increases the likelihood of it, but it can happen. I had it happen in two patients yesterday when I was just doing routine modified Epley's um, where I saw that response. I'm not bothered by it because when it happens, it almost predicts success. And I think Sue Whitney mentioned that in a prior podcast is if you see that the debris going from the anterior canal right back into the utricle, just leave it alone.
It's hard to sometimes convince your patient of that though, right? All of a sudden they have this response that they, it's more intense than any response they've experienced. And you're like, it's okay. It's a good thing. Yeah. They're like, thank you. You made me worse. <laughs> so, so now just kind of, you know, moving on, there's a lot of anterior canals very uncommon, right? It's not very common. It's something that we, we don't see very often. So are there things that can mimic anterior canal beef and BV? Are there things out there that will fool us into thinking that we have that? Yeah, the primary emerging issue, if we just talk about particles, is debris that's, this has three different names, so it's really confusing. So these are all synonyms. Non-ampullary arm posterior canal BPPV, the apogeotropic form of posterior canal BPPV, or short arm posterior canal BPV, those are all synonyms. You know, it'd be nice if we just had one name for things, but all those terms are implying that your debris is hanging out in the superior portion of the canal near the common cruise. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about this portion of the poster canal, which actually sits fairly parallel with the ground for a long stretch. One thing to keep in mind, which is confusing, is semicircular canals are not circular perfectly. They're sort of like a bent bike tire and the base of the canal is fairly flat. And so is this upper portion of the canal. So you might think, well, why would debris hang out there? Well, there's a fair stretch of the canal that's very fairly parallel with the ground. And so the thought is, is that you have debris that's hanging out in that section of the canal. And one reason it can linger there potentially is if this portion of your posterior canal, so I'm a bit away from the common cruise if you're just listening, if it's narrow and stenotic, the debris may not be able to get entrapped at the base of the canal. And all it will do is linger up here in the upper portion of the canal because it can't get past the stenotic area in this portion of the canal. Mm -hmm. It's one of the thoughts behind it. So with it, if you think about it, when you do Dick's halt bike testing, you could very easily see downbeat torsional nystagmus when you do provocative test, which looks just like anterior canal BPP theoretically would. So that's a mimicker. Um, a suggested treatment for that is called a demi semant, which is basically you would rotate your patient's head away from the involved uh, posterior canal and just do your second half of your semant maneuver, which is putting them nose down into the bed and sitting them back up. So basically you're doing this, you're taking your patient, well, it's the right side. We would turn the head left and then they would lie down to their left side to try to evacuate the debris from that upper portion of the canal into the utricle. So it's just called a demi-samat, D-E-M-I samat. Demi just means half, half a samat maneuver. Now, given the low prevalence of anterior involvement, would you suggest trying the demi-samat first if you are seeing this type of nystagmus? Yes, because I think it's more logical that that's where debris would be. Mm -hmm. But if that doesn't work, then I would in second then try the intercanal maneuvers. Yeah. So with uh, so with that, like um, with those patients, you would go put them back in a Dick's Hall Pike, and you might see that downbeat torsional response. And that's because of Ewald's laws. Again, you know the way that debris moves in the semicircular canal is going to change how it um, affects the nystagmus for the eye. With right. that, you're going to get you trick. Remember, you're going to get utriculopedal displacement if the debris is in the upper segment in that non-ampullary arm of the canal, which is inhibitory for the posterior canal. So you need to remember your torsional component's gonna beat to the uninvolved ear. Mm -hmm. Now, can that be also applied, that same thought be applied to the horizontal canal? Can you have otoconia in the anterior portion of the horizontal canal that would do the same thing in reverse nystagmus? So say, you know, you've got uh, otoconia in the anterior arm of the horizontal canal. When you go to do a roll, uh, the, debris is going to move in the opposite direction of what you would typically see with canalophysis. So you might have a non-persistent apogeotropic nystagmus. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I've seen that many, many times. Mm -hmm. What you, although it's easily self-corrected, um, usually if you just do repeated supine roll testing, pausing with nose towards ceiling, it'll convert to just a geotropic form just naturally by doing the testing. So I have patients with horizontal canal BPV that come in and at first they show me that brief burst of ageotropic and it stops and I'm like, huh? And I do repeated roll testing and I pause in the middle and then shortly after doing that, bam, now we're getting the classic geotropic form. So just by naturally doing the test, you can relocate the debris to the posterior arm of the horizontal canal. So. Yeah, that's a good analogy there with the horizontal canal, how it can happen with that canal also. 
I it's getting back of, to yeah. mimickers for anterior canal BPV. I think the other thing you need to keep in mind is downbeat nystagmus with positioning test is extremely common, especially in elderly patients. Mm -hmm. So especially during your exam, if you're seeing downbeat nystagmus elsewhere, like with lateral gaze testing, or you do a head shake test and there's downbeat nystagmus, you do positioning tests and there's downbeat nystagmus. That's a way to enhance or accentuate downbeat nystagmus in subjects. So especially if you're seeing it in other portions of your exam, I doubt that what you're seeing with positioning tests, if you're seeing downbeats is likely from debris, if it's already there in other portions of your exam. So that's something to keep in mind. Agents that can cause downbeat nystagmus, by the way, anticonvulsants, um, amiodarone, lithium, that's a mood stabilizer. So if you see your patients are on those uh, agents, keep it in mind. Chronic alcohol use, which I think is something we don't always ask about routinely. I think that's really important um, to query about that. So chronic alcohol, not acute intoxication, chronic alcohol abuse can cause cerebellar atrophy and create some downbeat nystagmus with positioning tests also. So you need to keep, I think, that in mind. And typically with that, you won't see a torsional component with the nystagmus. So it'll be kind of more persistent. Patient won't care that much about it. So they're not I think it's worth I think it's worth mentioning, um, kind of how you alluded to, you, you might see some baseline nystagmus and other testing, having a pair of goggles and making sure that you do your, um, you know, gaze stability with and without fixation to get an idea of what's hanging out in the background. So you don't muddy the waters with your positional testing. If you've got something that if you've got a um, right beating nystagmus, you know, without fixation, when you go to do roll testing without fixation, you might see that accentuated and mistake that for some form of nystagmus that is related to BPV. So knowing what you, you're working with that baseline is very important, especially when you're working with goggles. Absolutely. You'd be surprised how many patients we see from the ER that go in and in retrospect, we find out that they have acute hypofunction. So they're there with right beat nystagmus, no matter what they're doing. It looks real close, but they go back and study and the resident thinks, oh, I should do a dix hall pike test like this in a year ago. And so they do a dix hall pike test and of course they see right beating as soon as they put their head back, but didn't look close to see that it's there all the time. And then they get sent up to us with BPPV. So you really need, like Daniel said, you really need to investigate closely for spontaneous nystagmus. I mean, it can really affect the nystagmus you do see, even if your patient has BPPV. So for example, if you're seeing an elderly patient that has a little bit of baseline downbeats all the time and they acquire BPPV, when you do a dix hall pike and if they have posterior canal BPV, a lot of times you're only going to see like a pure torsional nystagmus that fades. And so you go and you look, well, pure torsional nystagmus is usually central, but their upbeat components being negated by their ongoing downbeat components. So that's those two sum vectors cancel out and all you're seeing is the torsion. So these tables we make up with eye movements that you see with each canal are very helpful, but you got to realize there's exceptions. If your patient has, um, we would like patients to have one disease at a time, but they often have multiple issues, especially when you get to, to positional nystagmus without dizziness is, is really common. And the goggles can be a sort of a curse because in some because mm -hmm. it almost shows you too much sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you're competing with those issues a lot. Now, what about multi-canal involvement? So, you know, you, you just kind of alluded to the fact that you, you can have baseline nystagmus that negates some of the motion that you would normally see in, in positional testing. Can, what does multi-canal involvement look like when you go through positional testing with patients? Can they counteract each yeah. other? Not, one thing to just step back and just briefly mention, the nice thing with torsion is it's not suppressible. So keep mm -hmm. in mind, torsional nystagmus should look the same when you deny fix, fixation versus allow it but horizontal nystagmus and vertical nystagmus can be suppressed. Now, humans are not good at suppressing an intense burst of nystagmus, but humans are pretty good at suppressing light ongoing nystagmus. So goggles are really helpful, for example, with horizontal canal cupulolithiasis, well, the nystagmus is all horizontal. If you have a lighter case, a human can suppress that pretty well. So always keep that suppression issue in mind that Humans are good at suppressing vertical and horizontal nystagmus only. And we're good at it when it's low grade, like when it's not real intense. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, so to the multi-canal BPV issue, this can go a lot of directions, but one of the most common things you'd see is bilateral posterior canal involvement. There's uh, literature in my personal experience, I'd say it's about 10% of cases. 
it's not an uncommon reason why a patient comes back and they're still dizzy after you treating their what you thought was just unilateral posterior canal BPV. So I can't tell you many times I've gone to, gone to test a patient and they have a little bit on their other side that I did not see at their first exam. So always keep that in mind. But if you have a patient that has bilateral involvement, just a suggestion. Um, if it's real severe on one side and real light on the other side and they live fairly close to your clinic, I would probably just treat the more involved side and leave the other side alone for a return visit. If they're traveling real far and they want to get it taken care of as quickly as possible, I would treat the less involved side first and the more involved side second, because when you treat that second side, there is somewhat of a risk of undoing your work on the, on the initially treated side. Hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I would always treat the lighter side first, stronger side second, and don't spend a lot of time in epley position number two with treating the second side, because that is a bad position to put that, that previously treated ear in. So you may want to consider when you do the epley on that side, going from one, either over rotating into, like I talked about earlier, or going right over into position three. Um, it, when you're treating that second side and just really closely watch the eye movements as you treat somebody with bilateral posterior canal involvement. Ideally, after the second maneuver, after you treated that second side, um, a nice marker for success is having the patient arise after the second treatment, the treatment to the second side, and there's no reversal nystagmus. So that's a key finding to look for is when you're all done with your last maneuver and the patient arises, no reversal nystagmus is ideally what you want to see with that. If the patient has the other com common combo we see is posterior canal canalithiasis and horizontal canal canalithiasis. If they're on the same side, I would treat the posterior first, horizontal second, because the horizontal canal maneuvers, you can do a Gaffoni's maneuver without putting that involved ear back down again. Mm -hmm. You can do your modified epilase, get rid of the posterior canal involvement, and then they're upright, go right into a Gaffoni's, and you're never putting that involved ear down again to let the debris wander out of the utricle. Remember, these multi-canal cases are more common with head trauma, by the way. So that's a common reason to have multi-canal involvement. Um, I would now, let's say let's ahead. say the patient is close to your clinic. Would you typically just treat one, maybe the more intense or severe symptom provoking problem and then have them come back shortly thereafter, the next day, two days after and see what's left? I, I don't think that that's bad advice if they live close just to take one canal at a time and take them in order of what you think is disturbing the patient the most. I. I tend to, as and the other thing you got to think about is their tolerance. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about doing all these maneuvers, but if you have somebody who's really prone to motion sickness and they're anxious, like, well, yeah, it's nice mechanically to try to tr take care of both canals, but you always have to think about your patient's tolerance to these treatments because you can lose patients. Like sometimes you try treating two canals in one day, it's the worst experience of the patient's life. And even if the treatment worked, they're scared to death to ever come back and see you because of what they had to go through to fix it for the patient that's really sensitive. So I think that's something we have to keep in mind also, which I need help with sometimes. <laughs> and y'all can tell you about that. So you put patients in wrestling holds and you also torture them. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know we are we're coming up on our time here uh, and there's still so much that we could talk about. Um, I think, I think a, a really helpful hint that you could probably give us or, or tip that you can give us is um, how we can look at testing for posterior canal cupulolithiasis. I have a lot of people mm -hmm. who think they have a posterior canal cupulolithiasis, and you have a really great way of um, reaffirming that. Can you talk about uh, how to yeah. test it? Um, boy, this used to really, really, really confuse me. And back when I started doing this 23 years ago, uh, there was I couldn't go to the internet to YouTube videos, and the textbooks were so basic. Like, it was figured out yourself time. <laughs> so once, so with posterior canal cupulothysis, a couple things to keep in mind. A common time you encounter it is you created it. So you have a patient who has canalothysis of their posterior canal. And this is, a, I think, one of the most common reasons a patient feels unsteady after you treat them for classic posterior canal BPV canalothysis is you relocate the debris back to the utricle. But if you look at the utricle, the 
utricular membrane where the particles sit only sit on an elevated shelf in the media in a small portion medially in the utricle there is a divot a pocket in fact i just recently heard somebody kind of describe it as a billiards pocket basically it's like a sinkhole where that debris when it comes back into the utricle can find its way into that divot and rest on the utricular side of the cupula and so you go to do a retest with your patient and you put them back and you notice, well, it's a lot better, but there's this light torsion that kind of persists when you do a retest after treating them for their classic BPPV. And I would suggest that's commonly because you, you relocated the debris back to the utricle, good job. But unfortunately that debris found its way against the cupula on the utricular side of the cupula. An excellent marker for this is when they're back in your dick's hall pike, and often the nystagmus is really weak, like it's just this light torsion and the patient's just like, oh, I don't know, it's like a one or a two. I just feel like I'm tilting a little bit. Elevate their head halfway up, we call it a half dick's hall pike. So you're just, you keep that 45 degrees rotation. So if you're doing a right dick's hall pike, their head's still 45 degrees to the right and elevate it halfway up, right? So that they're about in... 30 degrees of elevation from a supine position. And if that torsion accentuates, you know you're not dealing with loose debris in the posterior canal anymore because the nystagmus isn't reversing. It's accentuating because you took the cupula in a Dix Hall Pike position. It's almost close to parallel with gravity, but when you elevate the head in the posterior canal cupula perpendicular to gravity, and if there's heavy particles on it, it's going to maximally displace the cupula in that position. So I found that to be an, a half Dix Hall Pike is an excellent marker for a heavy cupula. Like if you're maximizing that torsion by elevating the head, start thinking, oh, the debris on the other side of the cupula. Here's some sad news. What can you do about it? I don't know. I've tried a variety of things and actually I've learned not to do anything because <laughs> I don't think I'm real convinced anything works to get it off of there. And also it tends to be highly self-limiting. Some good news is, is that there's a high concentration of dark cells, which are like the trash compactor for the ear located near the cupulas for the canals. And so you've relocated the debris back to a place where it's likely going to degrade. And almost every patient I see with this, not all, but most of them, it's very self-limiting. Like after several days, they notice it goes away. And by the time I see them in a week to retest them, it's completely gone. But there's a small number of patients where that can linger for a while. And again, they're in, their vertigo is less intense. They just feel like a postural instability when moving around. It's still accentuated with positioning tests and they just feel tipsy. So I just tell them what happened and have them understand it and inform them that it's usually self-limiting. I'm trying to figure out a way to do a maneuver so that that's less likely to happen. Hmm. And I'm starting to do Epley's now where when I'm done with the Epley, as soon as they get up, I elevate their involved ear like that when they're, when they, after they, immediately after they arise after Epley position three to try to compel the debris to move medial and anterior in the utricle instead of posterior lateral um, to try to get it on the shelf where the other debris is located. And we know these particles are sticky and some sort of hopeful the loose ones get a little bit adherent to their friends and so that they don't wander into this divot. Well, if anyone can figure out, it will be you. So thank you for your work there. <laughs> thank you for joining us today with all the clinical pearls related to atypical BPPV. Let our audience know where they can find you. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in coursework, I'm actually doing an expanded course on this topic for MedBridge. Um, it's filming in the late spring, so it'll probably be released in the fall. Um, so like it, this is an advanced module on BPV. I have 10 other courses on a variety of vestibular topics on MedBridge. So if you're interested in further education, medbridgeeducation.com is where I do most of my teaching. I do do some live courses here and there, but mostly online. I will say if you go to vestibular.today, you'll see there's a MedBridge tab and some other information where you can find live courses. There is a, if you don't have a subscription to MedBridge, there is a code on there that you can use for $175 off a yearly subscription, uh, which I think is a, a huge break and a great deal. Um, so you can take all 10 of those courses plus Jeff's new course that he's got coming up. And I feel like I still have so many questions about atypical beef maybe and other topics that we haven't covered. So we might have to drag you back here for a part two if you're up for it. 
Um, mm -hmm. But we really appreciate your time. And I know our listeners are going to be really excited to see you again on our feed. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. Sure. Thanks, Abby. And thanks, Danielle. Appreciate all your efforts. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos, blogs, continuing education classes, and resources, including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBV treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Act Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.